I'm going to talk to you a little bit about brick storage. See this? This is a brick. See it's laying right on the ground? Don't do that. Because what can happen is, and especially don't do this, see this is a roof. Water falls down here, gets wet, soaks up the dirt. Dirt then can leach up into the brick and that can change the brick's texture and you get uh, casting, you can get what they call blooming of the brick. So you don't do this. Now, I, the reason I've gone ahead and done this is because I'm not going to use these on anything external. These bricks will never be used. They'll be used as masonry infill, so I don't really care if they bloom or not. They actually came out of the Mississippi plant instead of the Alabama plant. So these are actually made with the wrong shade of uh, raw uh, uh, clay. So I'm not particularly worried about what they look like in the style of the brick I can get by with it anyway. But that particular brick, that particular pattern where you set them directly on the ground, wrong thing to do because it will suck up dirt and salts and materials that will later leach out and, and give you a casting or can give you a casting on your brick. Don't do that. Don't let them get wet and don't put them directly on the ground. It's a bad practice. I'm doing it because I don't care and I'm going to use them as fill. The same reason I save that rubble right there. I'll use them in a ditch or a hole or in something. So that's one thing you want to think about when you store your bricks for a project. All right, let's mix some mud. Okay, we're using Type S masonry cement, masonry sand, and a bucket. The mixture is three to one, three sands to one cement. Use a bucket. This is the proper way to do it. Don't use the shovel. A lot of people use the shovel. That's not the way you do it. You can't be very accurate when it's slipping and falling off the edge of your shovel. So you use a fixed volume. Five gallon bucket, two and a half gallon pail, three gallon pail, whatever you use. But use a fixed volume instead of your shovel. It just doesn't work right. Otherwise, you can't be guaranteed your right ratio. Now, I've pre mixed it dry. We're going to pull it around there to the pit and add the water. I don't know if the camera picks this up. It's one of those things that you need to see me turn it, but part time cameraman Ian is playing full-time wor worlds of Warcraft right now and it's his weekend but you see the mud is wet and it'll start to work a little bit as it cooks but it will stand if you turn it it will stand and it will butter on the brick so that's just about right we're going to really use it and we're going to let it set maybe five six minutes Now see that cart full of dry mortar mix? That's three five gallons worth of sand and one five gallons worth of uh, type of cement. Now what I want to point out to you is the first cart you saw wasn't nearly that big and the reason it wasn't is because you don't want to mix any more mortar than you need to. Mortar will go through what is known as the plastic state and that plastic state is when the strength is getting set up. If you disturb it in that plastic state you'll lose all your strength of your joint. And if you mix up too much, you end up with cold joints and that's no good either. So you want to use just exactly how much you need. Now you see these three bricks. You see how they got different colors? The different colors of the bricks refer to not because of different batch of clay, but because of where they were when they were fired. In the old days, bricks used to be fired in basically like beehive kilns. The big ovens that stacked the stacks around the inside, sort of like a big donut, and they started a big fire in the middle. And the fire would cook the inside ones and the very outside ones the most. And they'd get the darkest, it'd be the hardest. They'd also be the most likely to chip and break because they were harder. Now these days when they make bricks, they make them on a big assembly line just like a big choo-choo train. And they bring them through basically wet. And if they got them hot all at once, the water and the clay would turn to steam and the suckers would explode. 
So what they do is they start them at the back of the, the choo-choo train, and as they pull them through the kiln, they get them hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. So that by the time they get finished with the, at the tail end or coming out of the, the kiln, which is basically a big long choo-choo train tunnel, they're all up to temperature slow enough that none of them exploded, but they're cooked well enough. But they have the same problem. The outside bricks get cooked harder and more firm than the inside bricks, and you'll get a different color. This will also make them shrink more because as they dry in this cooking process, they get a little shorter. So sometimes when you see a wall and you'll see dark bricks, you'll see too many dark bricks in a row, you'll see what we call the head joint. What's a head joint? This little dude right here. Follow the, this line right here, this joint, when it lines up. You'll see them. They should be from the bottom to the top. I don't care if you got one story or a hundred stories. Those joints ought to line straight up one on top of another. But if your bricks get too small because they're different colors, they're different actual colors, you'll find sometimes when you keep the same distance here, because the brick is shorter, you'll actually get a little wave in this head joint as you go. Now, don't confuse a dark brick and a light brick with dark finish. See, this is just a dark finish. They put something on the outside of the brick. The brick itself is not dark. See this one? See, see a little bit of orange? The brick is still light orange. It's something they put on the outside. So it's not the color of the finish that matters. It's the actual color of the brick. That'll be your telltale sign. Like this one. This is actually cooked more than this one is. Does that make sense to you? So next time you see a big wall of a commercial building, go stand up next to the wall, lean your head back against the wall, and look up the head joint and see if it's straight up the wall or if it's waves and swiggles and wiggles like a snake up a wall. Now what I used to cut with was just a cheap, and I do mean cheap because you'll ruin the bearings on this thing and get the dust all in the motor and everything else, cheap saw. And sometimes with hardy board, you'll see that too. They'll use just a regular dry saw, and that gets dust everywhere. But if you're only going to use it once or twice, it won't hurt anything. Just get a cheap saw, expect to lose it, throw it away, and just use one of these little masonry dry saw blades. Do it in the open, use a mask, and do it where the wind's blowing it away from your house. Hopefully not at your neighbor's.